everybody's like, oh, coach, check, we're ready to go. Okay, good. You go through a grueling training camp, you get to the first game, and you look over and your players are blown. Like series three, they're exhausted, they're breathing heavy, and you're like, what is going on? Then the head coach takes his headset off and he looks over and he's like, you know, we're out of shape. And the, you know, then he looks at the strength coach and everybody's like, oh my gosh. And he's like, man, we are not in shape. You know, it's gonna take, take a couple of games for us to get in shape. That does not have to happen. I call that the first game conundrum. Today's episode picks up where we left off yesterday where Dr. Eric Quorum, former director of performance for the Houston Texans talked about the theory behind and the science behind scripting your practices in a way that gets your players ready for week one, about inoculating stress and all the different things that you need to prepare for with your athletes to be game ready. Today picks up and actually goes into how that's calculated and he takes you through some scenarios and thinking about what practice should look like as you prepare for that first game. Practices and scrimmages must simulate the game, the duration, the intensity. You, like everybody knows the feeling after their first game. As a coach, you're just exhausted. Well, you didn't do anything physically. There was actually a, a great article that came out in ESPN that talked about chess players and how they'll burn through thousands of calories during a chess match. Their brain is just an overdrive. Okay, ultimately what we want is when our players hit the field for a game, they can say, we've been there before. There's no situation that's going to come up that we are not prepared for. If you can get somebody to say that, you're in a great spot. You never want there to be panic. You want there to be calm so that people can think. So let's start with what the game actually requires. If you look at an FBS balanced offense, the average play is about 5.2 seconds, 5.2 plus or minus a, a second, and it's about 36 plus or minus 6.7 seconds off. So you mean you're going for this duration, you're resting for this. So 5.2 on, 36 to 40 off. An average special team play lasts about seven seconds. There's about six plays per drive. There's about between series of plays, there's anywhere between 11 to 15 minutes of sitting on the bench. Put a stopwatch to it. It will shock you. There's only been one 20-play drive this century in the NFL. The average worst-case scenario is typically 12 plays goal-to-goal. Now, I think Kentucky this year had an 18-play drive or something like that, but if you can think about the worst-case scenario – where you're just out there forever, 12 to 15 plays, goal to goal. So if you're working for five seconds, five to six seconds, you're resting 35 seconds between plays. The average series is six plays, and then you're sitting on the bench for 11 to 15 minutes. Think about what that actually is compared to what practice may look like. So this is how things have played out I've seen in the past, okay? You go through a training camp. Before the training camp starts, you everybody, you know, finish their conditioning test. Everybody's like, oh, coach, check. We're ready to go. Okay, good. You go through a grueling training camp. You get to the first game, and you look over, and your players are blown. Like series three, they're exhausted. They're breathing heavy, and you're like, what is going on? Then the head coach takes his headset off, and he looks over, and he's like, you know, we're out of shape. And, you know, then he looks at the strength coach and everybody's like, oh, my gosh. And he's like, man, we are not in shape. You know, it's going to take a couple of games for us to get in shape. That does not have to happen. I call that the first game conundrum. So let's look at practice versus a game. The average game duration is three hours. The average practice is two and two and a half hours. So that typically doesn't match up. Play duration, yeah, plays are plays. Duration of series, you know, game is around six. Practice, you know, you could go four plays with the ones, fours with the twos. If you're lucky to have threes, you may go two with the threes. Rest between series, 11 to 15 minutes in a game. In practice, you've only got four to five. Now, here is what happens, okay? When you, when you can go four to six plays in a game, 
then you go sit on the bench for 11 to 15 minutes. Do you think that you're recovered and ready to go for the next series? Yes. So what happens is plays in a game are really high intensity. Let's just look at physical intensity. When you're in practice and you go 4-4-4, 4-4-4, 4 4 4 4 4 4 4 4 4 4 4 4 4 4 the intensity, no matter how hard you try, comes down to what I call medium. It's submaximal. So you're actually not physically conditioning yourself for game situations. It's two different things. Now, I understand there's an economy of practice. You can't have every practice being three hours long. I totally get that. But it's just really good to orient yourself on what the game actually is versus what most practices look like. So we reverse engineer the process. So if we know the game series of six plays, near maximal efforts, the intervals are seven to 15 minutes, 11 to 15 minutes, you have a very high mental demand, high levels of emotional stress. You've ever heard guys come off the field, oh, I hadn't seen that before, da, da, da high psychological stress. There's another thing too that's going on is that a phenomenon I call the freshman versus the senior fitness. So the, you may have a stud freshman that come in. I remember sitting at a staff meeting, this is like seven or eight years ago, and we had this freshman come in who was a stud, right? But at practice, he looked worn out. The coach was like, he is out of shape. I'm like, coach, he's not out of shape. What's happening is, is, in high school, his skill and ability was here and everybody was here. So how much mental effort did he have to give? Not a ton. Now it's here or everybody else is here and now he's down here. So for every single play, every single situation, he's exerting that much more mental energy. So yes, the manifestation is he looks tired, but it's not that he wasn't in condition. There's the psychological component. Now that senior who jogs out on the field, it's like practice is nothing. Yeah, he's been training longer. He has more game experience, but he's also not under psychological overload. These are things to remember, okay, just to kind of store in the back of your head. So I said earlier, it's when you make a script, you're lifting weights on the field. So when you script practice, you are a strength coach and a sports scientist. Let me repeat that again. As a coach, when you script practice, you are a strength coach and a sports scientist because your body there are biological changes going on to adapt to the stress that you give it. So there's a principle called specific adaptation to impose demand said specific adaptations for imposed demands it basically means this: you get what you train for. So if you want athletes that are able to exert high amounts of power, strength, output, speed outputs in the context of the game, where you have six second efforts, 11 to 15 minutes on the bench, you need to construct things so that your biology is adapting to that. Because what happens is, is if you haven't done that, it takes a couple games to get into that quote game shape. We also, we've talked about psychological stress, we have to make, the, make scrimmages or those ones or twos during the week when we have really high intensity, we have to put our players and our coaches under the same psychological stress that they're going to face in a game, creating random scenarios. Everything has to be specific. So if you've ever been to a shoot house in the military, they shoot live bullets. Why? Because they want to say that we have been there before. Everything is when you have a bullet in the chamber, things change, okay? When, if you think about it, like if I want my coaches to be able to operate in a very high stress environment, then I wanna constrain them. I wanna have them on the sidelines with the comms on. I wanna create random scenarios. I want them to feel that stress, you know? So think about this, you know, it's skill acquisition. You're inoculating yourself your staff and your players to the stress of the game. And then you are a strength coach on the field. The condition that your team shows up up in game one begins. Yes. The off season is important, but when training camp starts, you're the strength coach. It's a lot. It's really awesome. I mean, it's a lot of power and a lot of influence. And the more you realize what influence and power you have, the more deadly you can get with your scripting. So how do you do this? 
this is just a random idea of how you may want to do things. But the first week of training camp is an acclimatization period. And let me just tell you this right now for all you college coaches. The NCAA, in my opinion, hasn't done us a favor because acclimatization is not going from helmets to shoulder pads to full pads. Okay, yes, you're acclimatizing contact, but you're not acclimatizing how much time you're on the field. It'd be like saying, I'm going to lift an athlete, put them on the bench, and they're going to bench press 200 pounds all summer. Okay, and then randomly one day for the next four weeks, we're going to put 330 or 340 on the bar. You think somebody's going to get hurt? Probably. Okay, you have to build them up to a certain level. So, you know, one of the easiest ways to do it is just with time. We're going to do 10 minutes of pre-practice. We're going to stretch for this long. We're going to practice for this long. We're going to have rest breaks for this long. And just build the duration of practice. Another thing is the duration of plays and series of plays. So maybe the first week it is just fours, you know, four on, four off, four on, four off, with that normal distribution of maybe having four to five minutes rest like it's actually going to work out. As training camp goes on, your goal is, is down here to be ready for the game, is now you start increasing the duration on the field. Now you start having 130 minute practice, 135 minute practice, 160 minute scrimmage, getting them used to being on the field for three hours and seven minutes like it's gonna be in a game. Now you start maybe stretching those series of plays out. Now you start hitting series of, random series of eight, six, 10, just random series. And now you may start stretching out the rest break between those series. That third week, you have an intense, another intensification. Now you're sitting, your average play is drive of six plays in group and team scenarios. You're hitting worst case situations, worst case scenarios. You're trying to get these longer breaks. One of the things that Keith and I were talking about during his podcast is he said he has his adjustment periods. And this is a great way, like, how am I going to fill that 11 to 15 minutes on the sideline? Well, If the ones go 10 plays and the two goes 10 plays, well, that's one way to do it. Another thing is the ones go and you present the ones, let's say the offense was something they'd never seen before. So they get that bite of what's going to happen during the game. They go to the sideline and then you debrief and you have an adjustment that takes place on the sideline. So now you're training your athletes to think like they're going to have to think at a game. The coaches come up with the adjustment. The players learn it. They go back out and execute it. Now you start having situations, 180, a three-hour scrimmage. Maybe you only hit 70 plays, but now everything is six plays, 11 minutes off. Maybe you have random change of possession. Six plays, punt, turnover, you're back on the field. Start creating these scenarios. So now you're inoculated physically and psychologically. Another thing to consider when you look at training camp is what I call workload consolidation. So what, what something I strongly suggest is you never go more than three days in a row of practicing. When you start hitting four days in a row, no matter if you're in high school, college, or the NFL, most soft tissue injuries start showing up between day six and day 10 because you haven't practiced that many consecutive days in a row before because of summer. Let's say summer offseason, you only go four days a week, and now you're asking guys to go six straight. They're not ready for that. Okay, also the rhythm of your week is typically a little bit different. So if you're going to practice hard, lift hard. If you're going to have an off day, make it a recovery day. The off day is not the day to do strenuous work. Walk through, pool, whatever you want to do, a team pool workout, just kind of get them moving. But you should have these really high highs and have these peaks and these troughs. Hard work, recovery. Really hard work, recovery. I also increase the, dura- the, the frequency of lifting. Maybe the first week you only lift once. Then the next week you add another lift in. Why? Because you're putting more of your eggs in the basket of practice. That is the most important thing. Lifting weights is not the most important thing when you get to training camp. Something else you can do is you can start looking at just time on the field. Week one, we're going to have this much time on the field. Week two, we're going to have a 10% jump. Week three, we're going to have a 10% jump, and then we're going to taper in week four. I'm going to talk to you quickly about why 10% increases in practice duration or practice load are really, really critical. So what causes an injury? Injury occurs when the training stress exceeds the body's ability to adapt. 
So if I can only lift 250 pounds and I put 315 on the bar, tissues are gonna give. You're gonna snap, crackle, and pop, okay? Same thing goes for practice. Mechanical stress exceeds the body's current capacity to tolerate the load. So whatever you adapt your players to, like in college, let's say FBS football, you only get eight hours a week to train them. And then the NCAA thinks acclimatization is going from eight to 20. That's not acclimatizing. It's a, it's a natural recipe for disaster. Now, in FCS football, we can get up to 16 hours with them. Coaches can work with them. Weight room can work with them. You get 12. That's a much better model. Okay? So if all I've been training for is eight hours of work, and now, boom, we're going to do 18 hours of on-field activity, or let's say we practice or 12 field of hours of on-field on activity, you're going to get hurt. A, a majority, a, a portion of your athletes are going to get hurt because they're not ready for that. They haven't trained up to it. So how do you prevent an injury? Introduce training at a substantially reduced level compared to the peak training camp volume or what a competition or the most work you're going to do during competitive schedule. So what you should do is look at what's the hardest week of training camp going to be or what's going to be the hardest week we're going to have during the season. Start with 50% of that or 60 or 70% of that. Progress training load at a manageable rate as athletes improve their capacity to tolerate load. And then proper training in relationship to the actual game demands. So their physical training in the summer or in the off season should match the game demands. We use something at William Mary called the tribe test. It's a specific interval, uh, uh, a specific shuttle test that we test our athletes on specific to the demands of game. It's five seconds on 25 to 35 seconds off, depending on your offense. I have an NFL team that just called me and they're implementing it for their team because it makes sense. 16 110s does not make sense. Why? You will do more high speed sprinting for an offensive lineman than 16 110s than you'll do almost in a whole season of football. Also, how often do you run for 16 straight seconds in a game? Doesn't happen. It's five, seven seconds in a special team scenario of really high outputs, coupled over six to eight plays, maybe with a lot of rest. So you got to be able to have a strong aerobic system and a really strong power output system or a lactic system. So your training has to match game demands. So it starts with a great off season that's specific to the game demands. And then you have to scale your work during training camp. So you are a strength coach on the field and then teaching the proper way, starting with where the athletes are and building them up through that. Now, you know what that looks like for your school. Maybe you have a young team. Maybe they got to start in a different place. Maybe you got an older team or veteran team, but they still got those younger guys. How are you going to address their needs? It gets complicated. But if you want to do it to a really high level, you got to think about all these things. So how do you estimate this training load? You can use something called a training impulse. It's a very inexpensive way to estimate training load. It's calculated as the sum of all session durations. So how long does practice last? And you multiply it by how hard the session was. And you use something called RPE to determine that. That's a, somebody's subjective assessment on how intense practice was from a scale of zero to 10. So it may look like this. When practice is over, you ask your guys one by one, or maybe you just take 10 guys, hey, scale of one to 10, 10 being super hard, one, zero being rest, how hard was it? They have to be able to trust them. Research shows that your subjective assessment of how hard training was matches exactly to how your body's adapting. We've actually looked at catapult training loads and RPE loads. They track almost identically. Here's a, a football RPE guide. If you guys want to email me, I'll, I'll send this to you. But like maximal would be like a 12 play drive, goal to goal, a four is low intensity drills, routes on air, uh, something like a six, maybe opposed one-on-one -on -one drills, et cetera, et cetera. So what you can do is you could map out what you think a one is all the way through a 10. Let's say you don't have a fancy GPS system or anything like that. I've done this before with coaches. You literally plan it out. Pre-practice is 10 minutes. It's an RPE of one. Stretch is 15 minutes. It's an RPE of two. We're going to do 15 minutes of practice at a five, 30 minutes at a six, and 20 at a seven. That's how much practice load Monday should be. Won't take you very long. You can plan it all out. 
then you can say you just add up the week and this is what the load's going to be like. You know, this is pen and paper. This is not anything complicated. You don't need any technology for this. And then you can compare it to what the athlete actually said it was. So rule of thumb, a weekly increase of more than 10% in training load is associated with a significant risk of injury across every single sport. This is demonstrated in literature. So you could work back. You could say training camp week three, we want to have 3,500 units load. We want to be able to go two and a half hours every day for three on, one off, two on. You just, you script it out. And then you just work back, take 10% off each week, and you can go all the way back into what summer training should look like to get you ready for that. If you prepare in advance, you should be able to put together a really good plan. Now, you may have to iterate that plan, but that's fine. It's the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. You probably said this to your athletes. It's your choice. If you don't plan it out, you're probably going to end up with a mess. If you plan it out and you work hard as a group, it's just like my golf game. My misses are going to be more on the fairway than they are out in the bushes somewhere. Uh, here's a great paper by Tim Gabbett, who has demonstrated something called acute chronic workload. This is going to be the last thing I'm going to talk about right here. That if you look at a ratio of what you've done in the past seven days versus what you've done in the past four weeks, when you've done as an average of what you did the past four weeks versus what you did this week, when it's about on average, you're kind of in the sweet spot for preventing injury, down to about 80%, all the way up to almost 130%. So let's say you do 30% more work this week than you did the week before. Your risk is climbing. Once you hit this area right here, you are in a danger zone, high risk for injury. It doesn't matter what sport you're in. If you just a rule of thumb, try not to have bigger than 10% bumps each week because then that gives you a little bit of leeway. Let's say you went over and you hit 15, you're still good. But if you plan for 15%, you're done. You're toast. So let's wrap this up here and then I'm going to answer questions. You got to start with the, getting the right framework of the mental model. Get the right people at the table to solve the problem. Maybe this means having your strength coach just sitting in the back of the room, learning what you're doing as a coaching staff so he can have a better understanding, having your sports medicine staff, maybe having a couple of your best coaches looking at this from different angles. Understand the goals of practice, physical, psychological, technical, and tactical preparation for game demands. It all has to be anchored on what the game is, not how you think you should practice, but you are preparing for a specific event that you have all the answers to the test to. Practice scripting has greater implications than just install. You are a strength coach and a sports scientist on the field. You have to analyze risk. You have to understand mitigating factors for injury. How can you prevent injury? Gradual increases in workload. Make a plan and iterate often. The plan's going to change. That is totally okay. But if everybody's towing the rope and they're all seeing things through the same set of eyes, we've got to see them through the eyes of the head coach. Whatever that is, we all got to see them through those, that lens then we're going to all be moving in, a, in, the, in the right direction. So, you know, I want to finish with this. Tinker Hatfield is kind of a hero of mine. He's the guy that designed all the uh, Jordan shoes. And he said, if people don't either love or hate your work, you haven't done much at all. So you may love this, you may hate it, but uh, hopefully it's provided some value for you today. So I'm going to go ahead and somebody, uh, Dean's or Dave said, you said you have an FCS for football. You can have 16 hours. Yeah. So you can have, I think, up to – there's a certain amount of allotment of like eight hours of mandatory training, physical training. You can have an extra four hours of, uh, of practice that – or training that's optional. And then coaches can actually go on the field and do stuff without a ball. So it can add up to a lot of work. Jason said, any thoughts on Chip Kelly's No Sweat Thursday or Wednesday for a high school Olympic practice? I think it's fantastic. I actually have research to demonstrate athletes peaking. So what happens is, is you have, you may have, uh, let's say we're anchored on college football. Let's say you have Tuesday and Wednesday are your really hard practices. So you have these really hard concentrated blocks of work. Let's say you look at the standard model, you go three days in a row, Friday's off or a walkthrough, and then you play Saturday, let's say at three o'clock. Well, now you've worked really hard for three days in a row and you haven't done anything for over 24 or it almost becomes 48 hours. It's sometimes hard to get the engine going. When you have this model where you go really hard, recover, and then 
stimulate going into the game. The players actually feel better. They're faster in the games. And I've talked to a lot of coordinators. They really, really like it because they get that final run through on different scenarios. And I know one coordinator will have the GA in the box and he won't even know the down and distance situation. The GA will tell it to him. They'll spot the ball and he'll start going through his script like a game. And if he just doesn't see that something's working, crosses it out, it's out of the plan. But, you know, there's different ways to construct that, but I've seen it work really, really well. Keith, is that it? Yeah, we're up against time. Uh, really appreciate you uh, taking the time. I know we've talked about uh, some of the Fast Friday stuff on, on the podcast. I think there's an article on USA Football's website too recently. And uh, as I said, follow me on Twitter and I can get some of your resources out there, Coach. You have great resources as well. What's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's just at Eric Corum, E-R-I-K-K-O-R-E-M. Is okay, and it's, it's uh, at Coach K. Grabowski. And again, Coach, thank you for your time. Got uh, it. Thank you, everybody, here, and we'll be starting the next session on the hour. Thanks, buddy. Take care. Thank you again for listening to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. I'll put some related links in the show notes. We talked about Fast Friday. We have a few episodes on that and other things that we talked about in this show. Also, you get that coupon code for the link to this presentation for free on Coach Tube, which will give you some of the slides and you can see him working through the math. Follow all we're doing at coachingcoordinator.com and follow me on Twitter at Coach K Grabowski.